So um, in this presentation, I'll try to mention more original texts uh, as addressing the non-Slavic audience. Inevitably, for the sake of this talk, I will have to focus somewhat more on Harms's circle rather than on Artaud. Um, remarkably, the general topic of uh, hieroglyphics of time, hieroglyphics of time, was developed by uh, one of the last Russian avant-garde uh, writers, Daniel Harms, and the French surrealistic at times playwright and poet Antonin Artaud. The Chinari group to which Harms belonged developed a peculiar system of signs, a mystical semiotics, if you please, of radical performance that often refer to certain messengers. This is the Oberiu, another name for Chinari. In Harms's texts, an encounter with these messengers is a reminder that time, as we know it, does not really <coughs> exist as we are accustomed to deal with it. For Harms, messengers are in themselves mythological hieroglyphs of temporality, dreadful omens of the imminent termination of Cronus. As the very last logical hears to the heroic Russian futurist avant-garde, Harms's circle of writers' obsession with the end of history was only natural. We must not forget Mayakovsky and his famous motto, we will ride the jade of history to death. No doubt that Italian futurism would provide an interesting parallel to these notions as well. As one critic has observed, for Harms, writing opens the possibility of multiple reversals of the constant breakdown of physical laws and with it the disappearance of regularity and continuity. In his seminal text, How I Was Visited by Messengers, Harms expressed his ideas on the concept of messengers, which he shared with another theorist of the group, Jakob Druskin, whose name Vladimir just mentioned in his talk. The letter wrote that messengers know the language of rocks. They achieve equilibrium with small error. They speak of this and that. Chinari, we are dealing with time as with something that is being defined as paradoxical and universal, intensive and extensive. When all his colleagues had already perished, Druskin proceeded studying the written heritage of his late friends, Vedensky and Harms. Each of them appears to be related to one of the categories of temporality. For instance, through the important notion of the fullness of times. Druskin speaks of two different ways Chinari reacted to the fullness, to, to the fullness of times, Vedensky and Harms. For Vidensky, there is only now. The now is actually the fullness of times. It may be called an intensive fullness of times. For Harms, now is an extensive identity of the past, the present and the future. Then everything he wrote also bears witness to his life, since his life always had primacy over his art. Harms kept everything he wrote. Nicolas of Cusa justly said long ago that absolute fullness and absolute emptiness coincide. Bedensky lived in an absolute emptiness, no place to lay his head, to be not at work. For him, I quote, the real time is just an hour before death. Harms, however, had an extensive and remarkable fullness of life. And both of these ways are, dialectically speaking, nothing but a one way, the virtual identity of the different, that is, the same in the different, coincidentia oppositorum, eschatological now, 
in both intensive and extensive form. According to Druskin, the special Chinar language is what he identifies as atonality, that is fixation of ontological nonsense, lingual, logical, timely, and situational. In his philosophy and theology, I quote, fixating nonsense means establishing the real ontological and gnosiological antinomy, identity of aporia or synthetic unilateral identity. By means of nonsense as category, Druskin binds together in a single movement all the cardinal currents of his thought and simultaneously comments on his basic philosophical and theological concept, which is time. A true absurd, according to Druskin, is absolute, and therefore is a sign and the quality of the divine. Whereas any attempt to make sense of absurd relativizes it and hands it over to speculation within the limits of human mind. The idea of ontological nonsense is related to Harms' another very close friend, a fellow Chinar Alexander Vidensky, again the name that Vladimir just mentioned. Druskin observes that Vidensky was engaged with nonsense of temporality since the early 20s. He used to say then, I am interested in three things. Time, death, God. In regard to time, neither of philosophers nor physicists could hitherto boast a satisfactory theory. Insoluble paradoxes, that is, nonsenses, arise in the theory of relativity and in microphysics. Biologically, death is comprehensible, but death of rational creature is unclear and absurd. As for the third theme, that is God, its incompre incomprehensibility by human mind is quite obvious. All these are super-rational nonsenses. The fact that time, death, and God, as chief aspects of the ontology of nonsense, appear in the focus of Bidensky's attention, uh, and this is obviously non-accidental. Druskin's famous text, The Star of Nonsense, deals with the creative heritage of this poet, subspecie absurd. The problem of time and the moment of nonsense eventually cross one another, at least within the limits of the issue of expression. We can also recollect Vidensky's description of the intensive fullness of time, the real time is an hour before death, as I just said. Dealing with hieroglyphical messengers of time, Harms tells that there was a knocking noise in the clock when these messengers came to me. Here you can see messengers, Desniki, painted by a Russian underground, uh, well, we may call him conceptual artist Mikhail Schwarzman of much later period, but he captured quite well to my idea, the, the, the concept of messengers by, by Harms. Harms says, I did not understand right away that the messengers had come. First, I thought something had gone wrong in the clock. But then I saw that the clock continued ticking and in all probability showed the right time. Then I thought that there was a draft in the room. And suddenly I wondered, what kind of phenomenon can this be for which both the flow ticking of the clock and a draft in the room can serve as the cause. Thinking this over, I sat in the chair next to the sofa and gazed at the clock. <coughs> the minute hand stood at nine and the hour hand near four. Therefore, it was a quarter to four. Under the clock hung a tear of calendar and the calendar's pages fluttered as if a strong wind were blowing in the room. My heart pounded and I was afraid I would lose consciousness. It was then I realized that the messengers had come to me, but I could not distinguish between them from the water. I was afraid to drink the water because I might by accident <coughs> drink up a messenger. 
What does this mean? This doesn't mean anything. One can drink only liquid. And are these messengers liquid or fluid? I could drink the water as there was nothing to fear, but I could not find the water. I walked about the room looking for it. I tried sticking a belt in my mouth, but it wasn't water. I stuck the calendar in my mouth. This also wasn't water. I forgot about the water and began looking for the messengers. But how is one to find them? What do they look like? I recalled that I could not distinguish them from water, so that meant they must look like water. But what does water look like? I stood and thought, well, so the messengers have already gone. I said to myself and started to change clothes in order to go visit some friends. Harms ends his text. So the main thing here will be to learn how to distinguish messengers from the fluidity of water. Hans's main personal theoretical influence as regards the problem of temporality and messengers, Jakub Druskin, wrote a special letter to him saying, Dear Daniel Ivanovich, the messengers have abandoned me. I cannot even tell you how this had exactly happened. I was sitting at night by the open window and the messengers were still with me. And then they weren't. It is already three years that they are gone. I occasionally feel the approach of messengers, but something prevents me from seeing them. Or maybe it is they who are afraid. I think I have to make some effort, perhaps some minor effort, and at the same time to lie, and then the messengers will be with me again. But it is disgusting to lie to oneself and to messengers. I used to think, maybe inspiration plays tricks to me, for I am a philosopher, I must write when I am calm and have no desires. Now, when there are no <coughs> desires, no inspirations, and the messengers have abandoned me, I see there is nothing to write or think about. I feel the proximity of messengers, but I am unable to actually see them. When a man dies slowly, and before that he is ill for a long time, this is what's terrifying. Every day he just gets a little worse. That's when you first see the inevitability. The same for the end of the world. Maybe it will approach over the course of the year. Druskin speaks a lot about the phantasmal meetings with uh, stranger messengers, which he believes to be hieroglyphic personalizations of time. These encounters will recur over several weeks from the 1st to the 15th of July. The final encounter will result in a vague anxiety, but then no one will see a messenger for the next two weeks. In the first days of August, he'll see them again. The first sighting will produce some surprise and even joy, the kind you feel when something familiar returns, but with more encounters, the anxiety will grow. There are certain sensations that vanish when you become aware of messengers. But the moment that you stop thinking about them, they reappear. So it will be then, so it will then be with the feeling of dread. But at the beginning of September, the encounters will resume. And this time, from the very first, the messengers will be accompanied by dread. This is how Druskin describes the end of days, the end of time. In the evening, heavy snow will fall, but it will completely melt by morning. Everyone's state will now be such that even the slightest chance occurrence, however natural, will instill fear. Spring will come very early and the weather will be good. In spring the sun will be bright, the showers brief, and there will be no grey overcast days. But by then all we have noticed, the slowing down of the moment, that even birds fly more slowly. The contrast, the contrast between a certain natural well-being and the human unease will fuel the dread. The sense of inevitability will become stronger. In fact, there will be something frightening about the promise of blue sky and hot sunny days. The dread will grow so intense that people will no longer be able to distinguish between the natural and unnatural. For Chinari, and in particular for Hams, dreams bear a special relation to human unique 
a perception of time as something internally paradoxical. For Harms, as one critic has remarked, dream is the mental action without past and future. Dreams, as this critic uh, has put it, is the pure appearance. It is deprived not only of materiality and physical action, but also of consequentiality and plausibility, volition and recollection. The waking state always brings about physicality and concreteness of matter, as well as reminiscences of the past. Unlike the dream, the waking state is never fully in the present. While the waking state lacks the pure present tense of dreams and death, dreams lack the materiality and physicality of the waking state. For Antonin Artaud, the concept of dreamy mystical hieroglyph was very important as well. Uh, drawing on Charles Baudelaire's concept of hieroglyphical dream from artificial paradise, Artaud perceives hieroglyph as an archetype of temporality. As Artaud puts it uh, in Sur le Theatre Balinaise and in some later works, hieroglyph stands for the ineffable higher reality of existence and makes it possible to destroy the mundane time flow of everyday life. In this context, hieroglyph is initially grasped as an unknowable noumenon of a Kantian din as such in both Hans and Artaud. Hieroglyphs are intimately link linked to the performance of the theatrical. In Artaud's manifestos, as well as in his letters, hieroglyph is perceived as a holistic entity, a universal manifestation of theatrical language. The inner gesture of a character and its hieroglyphic appearance represent the major traits of Artaud's theory of performance. Every hieroglyph sorry, has a con conditional nature which results from its acceptance in the audience. Similar to Harms's hieroglyphic messengers, Artaud's mystical hieroglyph gradually acquires, so to speak, the status of a full literary character. Literary personae in Artaud become decorated as hieroglyphs on stage. He frames his theater works with performers as moving hieroglyphs. This is something that we can call Artaud's corporeal metamorphosis, from hieroglyphs to bodies without organs, as recently put by one critic. We may consider, therefore, how the two avant-garde authors' attitudes towards mystical temporality of performance are related in the context of the larger debate on the modern body, identity, and subjectivity. The possibilities of a therapeutic theater that Artaud theorizes might be highly relevant to the question of the hieroglyphic body. Exactly like Harms, Artaud was extremely interested in Eastern culture and philosophy and was actively incorporating Eastern ideas in his art. One critic Artaud's reading of body practices like yoga and acupuncture represents a performative search for a praxis of the body, in which metaphysics is part of everyday life, an everyday praxis that establishes the possibility of metaphysical language for the external temporality and the performing body. Artaud's romantic misreading of uh, Balinese dance, as many critics point this, can turn out to be a particularly fruitful mistake, which points to an aspect of sacred performance that might restore modern Western theater, offering the knowledge of spontaneity and discipline, which mutually reinforces them. The hieroglyphic body could be grasped dialectically, as Harms says and Ruskin's messengers, it is both sign and substance, mind and phantasmal flesh, something free and something bound, whole and broken, and it generates meaning through the intricate tension of all these binary oppositions. Dealing with the uh, concept of hieroglyphic body or the hieroglyphic of the breath, our talk creates allusion to arcane knowledge concerning the manipulation of some hidden temporal energies. Artaud looks into and through the social and the human to other non-human realities. He looks back to all the traditions which, as those he saw, manifest in the languages of Balinese dance, 
Egyptian hieroglyphs, the later Mexican tribe of uh, Tarahumara, to support his own anarchic metaphysical vision. Despite the fact that uh, some of these languages, like Egyptian uh, hieroglyphics, are quite archaic, they represent existentially living, passionate manifestations of temporality for <coughs> Artaud. We should say that although Artaud uses the world hieroglyphic to elaborate his own metaphysical system of ideas, his notion of the hieroglyph still largely relies on the ancient Egypt. Hieroglyphic, uh, hieroglyphic uh, signs of Artaud, like the hieroglyphic body, refer to various substances being more than simply mimetic images or glyphs, combined in several different ways, joined together to create meaning. The reality and the event for Artaud's spectacle is dependent on ultimate materiality and the resulting immediacy. He coincides with Harms in this aspect. In his writing about Artaud, Jacques Derrida rather enigmatically tells that he resists whatever in Artaud's work operates, I quote, in the name of the proper body of the body without organs, and functions as, I quote, a metaphysical rage for reappropriation of the proper body and as an exorcism of all that is improper. What another avant-garde parallel of a literary body without organs can be drawn here at this point. Reducing this phenomenon to the ages old dialectics of the name, we may arrive again at one of Harms's most famous stories, The Red-Haired Man. This man probably had some body, but obviously had no organs. He only had a name. There was a red-haired man who had no eyes or ears. Neither did he have any hair, so he was called red-haired, theoretically. He couldn't speak, since he didn't have a mouth. Neither did he have a nose. He didn't even have any arms or legs. He had no stomach, and he had no back, and he had no spine and he had no innards whatsoever. He had nothing at all. Therefore, there's nothing, there is no knowing whom we are even talking about. In fact, it's better that we don't say anything more about him. Thank you for your attention, and I will just... <laughs> just another minor example of um, uh, closeness between uh, Artaud and Harms. Like Harms, Arto spent some time in a mental institution at Rodet, and there he composed uh, these two poems, which to my mind bear some interesting, uh, well, of course, unconscious battles with Harms, just for, for your information. There is no greater enemy for the human body than being. This is very hard something. Thank you. And now I will have to announce our further speaker. The uh, title of the presentation is Backward Futurism, Futurism's Archaic Structures in Italian and Russian Futurist Temporalities, Konstantino Dakov-Kashura, who works at Moscow State University. Please. <laughs>